So I'm Teemu from Rovio, and really pleasure to, to kick off the, this stream here, here at the PG Connect Helsinki. Uh, as Wilhelm said in his opening speech in the other, other room that Rovio has been growing faster than ever during the, uh, let's say, past two years. And one of the reasons behind that is the UA. So my speech is about how, how we made it happen and how we actually financially steered the UA to, to invest profitably and leverage that as, that as the growth engine for Ovio. So I'm a data guy, I'm a finance guy, so I'll start with some data. And this is from Apple App Store. And as we all know, it's it's very crowded marketplace at the moment. There are actually almost 800,000 games in the Apple App Store at the moment, and more than 750 games, uh, new games coming there every day. So that's the, that's the uh, market we are all competing and operating in. And at the same time, it seems that only a few games, actually less than 0 point, uh, 0.015% of the games are actually having meaningful MAUs, meaningful audiences. So how do we differentiate in that kind of marketplace? A lot of new games coming, coming in every day, already very crowded marketplace, and, 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 and uh, <laughs> becoming more, more uh, crowded all the time. So there are three, three different ways to actually differentiate. One is obviously to, to create a game that is unique and viral, that makes it through the, and to the charge, and, and everybody is talking about those games. The other alternative is licensing. So you license a well-known IP and, and uh, use that as a vehicle to grow your game. But obviously that can be quite costly. So I think many of the companies have made the same conclusion on, on the how to grow in the market, and that's the UA. And that's actually driving up the prices of acquiring more users into the, into the game. So the CPIs are going up all the time. And, and that makes it more difficult to actually build the audience for a game. And you need to hire bigger war chests and bigger investments to grow your, your audiences. So that's the, that's the environment. And let's now think for a while that we are all in the same company. We are shooting for our new mega launch, and these are the KPIs we have for our game. So D1 retention 50, D30 20%, global ARP DAO of $20 cents, CPIs from 5 to $10, dollars, K factor around 1.2 to 1.7. And we are not expecting huge featuring or any impact other than our UA for our game. So let's say that it's mere 20,000 down, downloads per month that we can expect. So how do we actually scale up this kind of a game? So let's put the reference point in there. It costs roughly 5 million USD to scale up the, or to build a uh, mobile game at the moment. It may cost more, it may cost less, but let's say that the 5 million is the ballpark. So how much does it cost? actually in a year to reach US iOS games top crossing charge, a meaningful position in the top crossing charts. And let's say that we'll start with top crossing 100. So any guesses, how much does it cost to, to reach uh, top crossing 100 position in the US iOS games? Obviously it's indicative, but based on our calculations, it costs roughly uh, 10 million, so double the development costs. You put 5 million in into the development, and you need to put another 10 million in only in the US iOS to, to reach top crossing with these KPIs that we just presented. What about then top crossing 50? It costs roughly four and a half times the development cost. So roughly a bit more than 20 million USD to, to reach that position. Already starts to be a quite a big investment in a year. To, to reach the position. Okay, we are more ambitious than that, so what about top crossing 10? Any ideas? It costs roughly 15 times the development cost to reach the top crossing 10 position in the, in the US iOS game start. Of, of course, it fully dependent on the KPIs we just went through and, and also many other things, not least the featuring or, or other organic impact. 
But with this setup, with these KPIs, we expect that it's roughly 75 million that you need to put annually to, uh, in to, to reach the top 10 top crossing position. So it's quite a hefty investment, isn't it? So how does it, what does it mean to your business case? It means obviously that, that you need to have the war chest. So here, you, let's assume that the development time has been two years, so you have invested the five million, maybe a bit more in the development. Then you put money in for a year to, to the UA to actually buy users, to buy audience for your game. And then we, let's say that we stop the investment after the year of UA. And then the revenue starts to climb up and you, you make eventually a return after, let's say, three years. So now in today's marketplace, today's environment, I, I think it's fair to say that this uh, amount of money has increased very fast that, that you need to put into the into game actually to make it successful. It's not no longer enough to just to build a good game. You need to have this up to 15 times the money to actually build the audience in a year only. And then if you extend it to three years, it's, it's quite much more. And also from financial perspective, it may not be profitable in the end. So that's an investment. You don't know if it's going to uh, bear any returns to your game later on. And that's the nature and that's the riddle we are trying to, to solve in the, with the financial governance. For example, with these KPIs that we just presented for our own company, for the mega title, it seems that they are not enough to actually reach the, or they are uh, resulting in a lower returns as they would result for a top 50 investment. So lower UA would actually result in a better profits, better return for the company. So I think quite simply we can say that you, you need, it's not enough to, to put money in. You need to have a good game first and that's eventually what it is about. And then only after that when the game is UAable, you need to have the war chest to scale it up and then optimize the UA so that you can optimize also your returns, not only the rankings or, or revenues or some other metrics. It, the money that comes in at the bottom line is what matters to the, to the company in the end. So the question is, of course, then how do you make it work? And in the following slides, I'll share some of the learnings we have encountered and learned at Rovio now during the past one and a half years. And let's start from the basics. So all the industry insiders here, I think these are very basic information. So how to measure the, the profit. So LTV compared to the effective CPI or CPI if you don't want to use K factor. And then it needs to be higher than the, the target your company wants to achieve. It may be 10%, it may be 0%, whatever you, what is the ambition of your company. On a macro level, it means that we compare the cross profit to UA spend. And essentially, I would vote for cross profit and, and really uh, highlight the importance of having cross profit rather than revenue because there are some direct costs involved in the, in the, also in the UA spending or related to the UA spending. So if you only measure revenue, you may actually inflate your returns a bit, which may not be good, uh, good to the bottom line. So this is the macro level. Uh, view on the, on the profit and obviously again the time frame is another factor that will affect on the return. So you may want to have a six month payback rather than 12 month payback or even 20, 24 month payback for your game. And it affects on the level of, of payback you, you want. How do you, how do you monitor that? So how do you make it work? Uh, this is one way of doing it. This is how we did it at Rovio. So and are doing it at Rovio at the moment again. These are not actual figures from Rovio, but just indicative. So in the bars, we are showing the monthly UA spend and the black curve shows that what is the target return we expect from that investment. So let's say that six months ago we invested this much in UA. We should be at this point of, of, of the return curve at, after the six months. After the first month, we should be here. And by plotting your own actual returns on the, this curve, you can follow that if you, are, if you are reaching the target returns or not. And 
well, of course, the UA team, and, and we all should focus also or follow also the more frequent metrics on a daily basis, even more frequently. But, but this gives a good overview on a steering level, on a monthly steering level, how much returns we are getting, and it's still like frequent enough to, to make actions to, to change the, the optimize the invest, investments if, the, if it's not paying back as we want. Okay, clear as water. Let's go and execute. Well, not quite. There are some things that, that will impact on these formulas and, and the investments, and, and I'll highlight now four of those in the, in the following slides. So first, games are different, quite obvious. People are different, or players are different, also quite obvious. Geographies are different, and finally, K factor, should we include it or not in our modeling? These four things are something that can quite easily impact a hell of a lot on, in the models and, and make them go or make us like, really uh, be able to scale them up and, and optimize our returns. Let's start with the uh, first one. Games are different. So here we have now three different games, one casual game, mid-core game, and, and another mid-core game with their UA ROI target curves for 12 months and the last for 24 months. So this is what we are expecting back from these games uh, in terms of UA. And let's now focus on the first month of investment in, in all of these games. So which one would you pick, actually, after the first month? Let's say that you don't see the other months. You only have received one data point return. OK, obviously, it seems that this mid-core game is bringing much more money than the other games. So it must be better than the other games. But when you look at the annual return, it appears that, actually, after 12 months, they are bringing the same return uh, in the end. It's just that this converges better in the early days, and then it saturates and reaches to the same position as the casual game. While then the mid-core 2 game starts more, more with a lower return, so it converges more slowly. But actually, after 24 month, months, it reaches higher return than the two games. So do you have the stamina and courage to actually uh, wait for another 12 months to, to to take the returns that is available there on the market. So these are the decisions you need to do with all the games. And obviously, it leads to one very important conclusion, which is that games you can't compare games. You can't compare genres. You, you need to treat them as independent business cases. And from that point of view, optimize the UA and, and plan the, the upcoming UA investments. So that's the lesson number one. Treat games as independent business cases and scale them up to the max these games can achieve. Secondly, players are different. So we have here uh, 2 million paid installs, of which 100,000 are spenders and, and 1.9 million non-spenders. Both of them, these cohorts, are having their own KPIs, so lifetime calculated from the retention, 30 days for spenders and 15 for non-spenders. Non-spenders are not spending any money, so no ARPDAO, IAP ARPDAO. Uh, spenders, 30 cents, so pretty good ARPDAO figure. It leads to LTV of 9 and LTV of 0. If you look at the combined number, and if you only would look at the combined numbers generically, you would actually have LTV of 0.2. So I bet nobody of us would invest in this game with the LTV of 0.2. At least it's not profitable. It's quite difficult to get CPIs lower than that. But if you look at the spender cohort only and the LTV of 9, you can actually make decent amount of money with that game. You just need to be able to, to find uh, channels to buy spenders, uh, focus on the performance-based UA, uh, CPAs to and base CPAs that are lower 
lower to 9, 9 to actually build up the code. It may be more slowly, but you can still ramp up the game, and maybe later, when the game improves, the company LTV also improves. And, and additionally, of course, then ads are excluded from here, but the same applies for ads. So, so the players consume ads differently, and if you're able to uh, track it more closely, you can target ad whales, and through that get more uh, exact numbers for your targeting and, and leverage that actually ramping up the, the UA and the, and the game. So another learning, players are different, don't treat spenders and non-spenders uh, uh, generically, rather focus on spenders, try to understand who are the spenders, how they are spending, and, and that will help you scale up the, the UA. Thirdly, geographies are different. So this is sample data from one of our games, and it shows the UA ROI on the y-axis, and the ACPI on the x-axis, and, and the bubble size implies the cohorts, how, how the cohort size, how big are the cohorts that we have acquired. So I think you, we can make two conclusions, at least from this one. So there are some fairly small cohorts that can yield the extremely high ROIs. And if you only focus on the relative numbers, you can be very happy, happy about these cohorts. But in the end, they don't bring you a lot of money, absolute money. So you can't pay your salaries only with these, these cohorts. On the other hand, uh, there are, let's say, mid-sized, pretty large cohorts that you can acquire and find in many Western markets, East Asian markets, that are lower in the CPI than some other, let's say, more crowded, more populated markets. So if you can optimize and, and wisely use, put your UA money into those uh, markets, find those cohorts, you can actually optimize the UA and again, make it more profitable and scale it up more. Of course, then it requires more collaboration, more operation with the, with the partners or internally building up the team to, to be able to, to go with the global scale. Fourthly, cave factor. I think that's an eternal uh, point of discussion in this industry. Should you use it or not? And let's define the cave factor first. So here I mean with cave factor that how many organic uh, users each paid user is bringing with him or her to the game. So if, the, if you bring one additional organic user, it's a cave factor of two. So one plus one, two. And, and another related term is the organic multiplier. So it, that's the ratio of the whole total downloads, the organic downloads to the paid downloads. So that, that's, then you take the big picture view and look at the total downloads, how many of those are organics. And again, sample data from one of our games with the organic multiplier. So you can see that the organic multiplier is evolving a lot during the lifetime. Obviously, the discovery uh, featuring uh, uh, things that are impacting on the organic multiplier, while then the cave factor is more a virality metric. So, so what is the intrinsic virality of the game? And now looking at this graph, what is the cave factor you should use for the modeling? In the best case, we can use this one. In the lowest case, we can use something like this. Obviously, huge difference in, in the impact and, and of, on your business case. By overestimating a K factor with 10%, it means that you're over inflating your ROIs by 10% in the worst case. And you can do it by 100% here if you are over optimistic. So it's very dangerous and, and may lead to uh, over financial decisions if you use it wrong. So I suggest to study your K factor organic multiplier and tie it to the events. Uh, possible featuring other factors that are impacting the cave factor and, and how you can do that and understand that the, the impact much better. And how we are actually doing, doing it at Rovia is that we f first focus on the uh, in, this, in the initial period we try to get leverage the organic multiplier to the uh, utmost uh, extent, and then we take it down and are more conservative with the K factor. But that's the 
complex riddle that we are facing in the, in the games business. And definitely it's, it's complex, there is room for optimization, but it's also resolvable. So we can resolve it. And I think there are two factors that are determining how you should approach it. Uh, first is the overall world chest, world chest. So how much money do you have overall to spend in UA? And the second is, is the ambition. So do you want to aim for a huge Big Bang launch and hope that you can actually recoup that investment faster and put it back in the UA? Or do you expect that you can scale or take more conser conservative approach and scale it back uh, in a more conservative way so that you have endurance for the, let's say, three-year investment period? And that's because of the fierce competition, uh, how, how we have uh, reasoned out at Rovio is that you need to be able to endure for several years. So you need to think it from the rather marathon perspective uh, rather than a sprint perspective. So I think it's better put your marathon shoes on when, when starting rather than spikes and aim for a short sprint. Thank you. Thank you, Timo. So um, I think we've got a minute or two for questions, if anyone has a question. I mean, I personally thought that was a fantastic way of explaining just how complicated it's getting in terms of understanding the space, but also why we have to think in, in, in kind of rounded ways, not just assuming we chuck money and it all works. It's, it sounds like you're really kind of getting down to you know, almost a kind of uh, a method of a, a way of thinking about games which is much more holistic. Is that fair? I think that's exactly the way to say it. So it, you need to be holistic on the UA investment and think about the whole business case and how the UA fits into that business case. So if you divert from that, it, it, they can't be disconnected. So it needs to be a holistic approach. So we have a question over there. Yeah, I don't know if we've got a mic. I tell you what, let me, let me come down. I'm not aloof. I can come down. Thank you. Uh, thanks for a good talk. Uh, can, can you share more about the methodology you use to measure the k-factor? It's, it's quite deep discussion, so maybe we have another chat. But that overall, I can say that there are like regression analysis is a good way to actually try to evaluate it compared to downloads and, and see the, what kind of events, what you have, have you done to the game and, and what kind of events there has been and, and if there has been featuring. And, these kind of things and try to separate those and, and through the regression analysis understand the impact on the downloads. That's like high level. You could say it like that. It's a, clearly an area we need to have more, more discussion on. Timu, thank you very much. Thank you.